In 2017, the sole trend in smartphone design was eliminating bezels. Apple had released the iPhone X, the first big visual differentiator in a decade. Samsung's new Note 8 also ditched the physical home button, and unlike its predecessor, didn't spontaneously combust. A new competitor, Andy Rubin's Essential, was trying to break onto the scene with their new modular ceramic and titanium PH1. So it should be no surprise that it was also around this time we first began hearing the phrase, smartphones are boring now. Innovations had slowed to iterations. So when Red, a niche camera maker co-founded by Jim Jannard of Oakley Notoriety said that they were entering the market with their own smartphone, complete with holographic display, people were skeptical. But because it was Red, the camera maker of choice for many tech YouTubers, this phone got way more coverage over the following year and a half than it probably ever deserved. It launched late with an insane $1,200 to $1,600 price tag and was universally panned upon release by every reviewer. Even MKBHD, who acted as an informal ambassador for the product throughout its development, had this to say in his final review. As of right now, there's honestly no way to recommend this phone for $1,300. Like, imagine this phone without red attached to it at all, without the red label or the red name on it. This is... At that point, just some hopeless, like random Android phone, probably a $400 device uh, with no hope of ever getting modules. Ouch. Jannard felt so persecuted that he slandered reviewers on the Red Forum stating that they didn't get it. And his continual conniption fits surrounding the launch are rumored to have led to his retirement, but also the cancellation of the entire hydrogen program. Not just the phone or the modules that were promised to come, but even Red's rumored lithium 3D cinema camera. But hindsight is 2020. Is it possible that Red was onto something? Could 2023 look different if it weren't for those meddling reviewers not understanding Red's vision? Well, I bought a new inbox Hydrogen One smartphone to find out. But wait a minute, because two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen makes water. And water is fun to swim in. Today's sponsor, the Aper Siegel Pro, ensures that your water-filled pool stays spick and span. This pool cleaner is the most powerful cordless robot on the market with quad motors for suction and draining. The end result is more than 130 gallons per minute being moved through the Siegel Pro's generously sized filtration system. I was surprised at just how much debris this was capable of tackling, and the rubber brushes even seemed to smooth and polish the pool's plaster walls. Now, this thing isn't like standard pool vacuums that just aimlessly wander around. No, wave path navigation ensures complete coverage in minimum time on both floors and walls. With up to three hours of cleaning capability, you can cover even the largest pools in no time. But with auto parking that puts itself near a wall in conjunction with the rapid water release system that drains the bot in seconds, it's easy to quickly remove it and recharge it in just 90 minutes with the included fast charger. Get your Aper Seagull Pro today with the link below. And here it is. This retail packaging is actually really quite nice. We've got the Red Media Machine Hydrogen logo. It's uh, it's 3D, maybe to accentuate the idea that this is a 3D capable phone. We've got hydrogen written, and then of course, Red Media Machine. This is not a smartphone, it's a media machine. We've got a nice little magnetic clasp. Ooh, that's a really nice magnetic clasp. And when we open the box, the phone is just right there, still wrapped in its retail plastic and all. Oh, look at that hasn't been torn off yet. Why is this thing brand new in box? Well, I have a theory. There were two models of this device. There was an aluminum, uh, aluminum model, this one, that was $1,200 retail. But if you had the money, there was a titanium version for $1,600. Red basically had a bunch of delays with producing the titanium models, and those were the people that had given them the most money 14 months prior. And so as an apology, they said, hey, we're gonna send you all an aluminum foam right now, and when we send you the titanium model, you can keep the aluminum model for free. You're, you're welcome. So they basically got two phones for the price of one. Kind of, if you can say that this was worth its retail price. So that's why I'm assuming this is new. It was a titanium pre-order holder that didn't uh, end up unboxing it, and now I got it off of eBay. Okay. 
So we've got a little welcome packet here. That's a, that's a nice little detail. There's a hole with the red media machine logo there. Okay, now this is one hunkin' large charger. It is USB-C, but this was, uh, you know, 2018 by the, phone the uh, by the time this phone shipped, so it better darn well have been. Is it fast charging? Three amps at five volts. Yeah, that's 15 watts. All right, so that's not too bad. And then we've got a USB-C cable. It is red branded, so that's obviously worth like thousands and thousands of dollars, but it's just a rubber USB-C cable. There's nothing particularly fancy about it. Okay, so we've got the phone. Let's peel the plastic. Are we ready? <sighs> and we'll do the back. Where's that pull tab? Here it is. That one was less satisfying. And the camera lens, don't forget that. <laughs> okay, this phone is still rather unique looking. You've got carbon fiber up here and down here. You've got this almost heat sink like looking uh, extruded or, or milled aluminum, which is pretty cool. You've got the red logo right there, which is glossy. And then those sides, as I mentioned, have the grippy texture. We've got a power button and fingerprint sensor right here. We've got a shutter button because this thing was all about media, right? Yeah, we'll talk about that. And then on this side, we've got our volume buttons, which are independently placed in these little, uh, in these little wells. Okay, cool. And then up here, we've got a lot of sensors. We've got some ambient light sensors, we've got an IR sensor, and then we've got two front-facing cameras. That's for the 3D effect, and we'll talk about that shortly. You also had two cameras on the back, and that was for creating stereoscopic content or stereoscopic 3D content on the back. This right here, though, is perhaps the most interesting thing about this device. Red, for the whole entire time that they sold this phone, promised that there would be uh, modules for this device. Now, there had been modular smartphones before. The Essential that I just mentioned had tried and failed pretty miraculously. There was the Moto Z line, amongst others. But what was unique about this is that it was red. They make cinema cameras. And I think their vision was such that not only could you view 4V content, which was their 3D content we'll talk about shortly, but you would be able to create it on the device. Interestingly, uh, one of the big pitches they had early on was that you could replace this section with an actual camera sensor. That was kind of a scam. That never ended up happening. And as I fix it showed in this teardown, you can't really get in this device. It's completely destructive by doing so. There was no modularity up here. That never ended up happening. The only thing that could have happened was these pins down here, but we never found out what they were and they never existed. So cool, waste of time and money. Let's see if this thing has got enough juice to power on. I mean, it definitely doesn't unless the eBay seller charged it, which ah, <laughs> they did. Okay, so this is just 2D so far. Um, not super impressed. Come on, when does the 4D pop in? Or th 3D, 4V, 3D. Ah, uh, raising the bar. You gotta have the carrier branding. Come on, what's a smartphone with that? That's it. There was no like 3D boot screen. That's too bad. Oh, <laughs> listen to that. Those are actually kind of cool sounds. We can see that this is basically stock Android. Not only do we have the all of the stock Google apps, but we've got Carrier Bloatware 2, AT&T ProTech, AT&T Call Protect, Amazon. Oh, great. Thanks for that. And then we've got Red's own apps that have these really actually, honestly, quite terrible off looking icons. So let's, uh, let's open one of them. The Red Player. Um, okay. Aha, here's some pictures. Yeah, I don't know, This it's just not very good. You know when you go to a 3D movie and the objects kind of come out of the screen towards you slightly? This does not do that. <laughs> this is more like a Nintendo 3DS where these headstones are not popping out at me. They're just exactly where I would expect the screen to be. They're flush. But then these ones back here are sunken into the screen by like maybe half an inch. Feels like I'm looking into a diorama, maybe a little box slightly, but it's not 3D in the sense of like you thinking about 3D um, traditionally. It's it's very subdued and very subtle, but holy smokes, this, the screen is just so green. And, oh my gosh, this image is... Okay, let me turn this to 2D mode. So you see how we've got this branch here on the foreground? This, in the background, there's this little golden pillar. This is behind this table. 
And when I turn the 3D effect on, there's tons of chromatic aberration. I can actually see the individual red, green, and blue colors of the display on this pillar. It looks truly, truly terrible. And yet, when I turn it into landscape, those disappear. It actually looks way... Hold on, this looks way better in landscape than it does in portrait. I still have a green overcast, but oh, yeah, the difference is night and day. Now, this hardware is kind of interesting, because prior to this, in a Nintendo 3DS, you can't turn the display multiple ways. Part of the technology that made this phone cool was that it was directionally agnostic. There's a hardware layer that allows you to view it in both portrait and landscape. But that does come at an expense of brightness. And let me tell you, in 3D mode, it is really, really dim. And even in 2D mode, this was not a bright display, even for the era. But I don't want to be too hard on this phone yet, because these are just pictures. Let me load up some video by going to um, the hydrogen network. Uh... Okay, <laughs> internet connected phone. Yeah, none of this stuff works because <laughs> I think the servers are down. What about uh, this Red Leia Loft app? Ooh, that's 3D. It's kind of cool. An error occurred. Please try again. Yeah, we are not going to have any luck getting content loaded on. Crap. But fear not, after hours and hours Okay, it was like five minutes, and then we went home for the day of spelunking the internet. I found a help page on Leia's site that has final build packages for the Red Hydrogen One. But what is Leia, and why is their name on the phone itself in just about every app and more? Didn't Red make this thing? Well, Leia was a project born out of HP Labs that, according to its founder, was working on using nanostructures to route light through computer chips for optical interconnects. And that, due to a resulting fire drill that brought one of their prototypes outside, they noticed huh, the refracted sun had created a holographic-like 3D effect. HP Labs spun off the project to focus on displays, and so it was Leia that developed their light field technology for RED. The main differences between this display and, say, a Nintendo 3DS are twofold. First, it's orientation agnostic, so it works in both portrait and landscape like we discovered. Just a lot better in landscape. Secondly, there is no lenticular jumping. The Nintendo 3DS, even my new 3DS XL, which has the IR cameras to compensate for off-axis viewing, has a very narrow tolerance, and the effect falls apart even five degrees off-axis. The Hydrogen One's display uses guided wave tubes that have 64 different perceivable viewing angles in multiple orientations. So it can even be viewed by multiple people at the same time fairly convincingly. Uh, that's nothing that could be done by the Nintendo 3DS. So the technology really was cool. The 3DS was frankly no match, and even though I'm not that impressed by the 3D effect, it is a lot more versatile than the Nintendo 3DS. This is an innovation. But it was a big bet for Leia, just as much as it was for Red. One thing that I really found interesting is, is not only did Leia seem to manufacture the display and the technology inside of the screen, but they also seemed to do pretty much all of the app development that just had red branding plastered over the top of it. So the Red Hydrogen Network, where you could rent movies and share pictures with friends, was the same as Leia Pix and Leia Flix two separate apps that existed afterwards. The Red App Store was just Leia's App Store. Even the camera, an app that you would expect Red to have a lot of involvement in, just seemed to pretty much be done, developed, and maintained by Leia. And the camera is where most people were disappointed. I mean, this is Red. They make cinema cameras. If they should be involved anywhere, it's here. But the camera app is just not very good. It's not super intuitive. There's a 2D toggle and then a 3D toggle. When you put it in the 3D toggle, and I'm someone who is not easily nauseated, this gets really weird <laughs> because you're seeing yourself in 3D but not really 3D and your eyes are kind of cross-eyed because of the 3D effect. It's really strange. And furthermore, because these cameras are parallax, they only work in their respective directions. And so uh, the, the 3D effect is not really a 3D model. It's just two cameras that are slightly off axis. They take a picture from a slightly different point of view and you get a slight holographic effect. But it wasn't as effective and as convincing as all of the 3D models. The photos that you would share were uh, okay. 
So, all right, yeah, sure, maybe the 3D effect's not that cool, but at least the 2D photos are gonna be good, right? Well, no. There was a lot of excuses made at the time saying, well, well, RED doesn't make the silicon. They're just using probably a Sony IMX sensor, and so there's really only so much they can do with the image processing pipeline. But they weren't really doing a very good job. <laughs> Other cameras of the era, from Samsung and Apple and certainly from Google, were all using similar, if not identical, lenses, and they were getting much better photos than what RED was doing. RED's processing was not very aggressive. It was very muted, photos came out slightly desaturated, and from a filmic standpoint, maybe that's good. You can have the ability to change some of the stuff in your photos, but they didn't really have more dynamic range because they were just JPEGs. Apple was already allowing you to shoot in RAW, and other manufacturers were allowing you to do so through certain third-party apps, but you couldn't do that on RED. This was a JPEG processed pipeline, and that's it. And part of that because is because of the SOC, part of that is because of the image sensor, but I think most of it it's just the fact that Red didn't really care. And so the end result is a camera phone from a camera company that's not a very good camera with a gimmicky 3D effect that doesn't really work that well, that doesn't have content built out for it, and what becomes the, uh, the value proposition? I don't know, it wasn't excellent even for a phone of the era. Even after RED discontinued the Hydrogen One in 2019, Leia, to their credit, kept supporting the device for another year. Not with Android updates or with hardware support, that wasn't their job, that was supposed to be Red's job. But Leia did release updated apps for the Hydrogen One sans Red branding, the Leia versions of all of them. So, for example, here's a game called The Uncatchables. It's just Flappy Bird, <laughs> but it's for the Hydrogen One. And it's in 3D, and I gotta say, it's, uh, I mean, the production value isn't super high, but it's... It's pretty fun, and the 3D effect on here is just as good as I think it would be on the Nintendo 3DS. One of the things that they were pitching that was like their up-and-coming thing was a dungeon game. This one in the Hydrogen One never actually ended up releasing because the CPU couldn't handle it. The SoC was too slow. So basically, this is just a pre-rendered Unity project that is uh, being played back on the uh, device. But this is by far the most convincing, the most eye-popping 3D effect on the Hydrogen One. And it's a bummer that this game never really saw the light of day because it looks pretty good. Last, and then probably certainly not least, the greatest application for 3D would be for video. Leia announced and released their Leia Player, which was way better than the app that came bundled with Red, that allowed you to watch 3D movies, um, if you found them or downloaded them from the internet, uh, by just loading them onto your device, turning the 3D layer on, and you're off to the races. Is this the best 3D effect I've ever seen? No, but it's pretty decent. It's almost as good as something I could get at the movies, and given that nobody has a 3D TV anymore, eh, it's not bad, honestly. Now, while Red gave up on the 4V format and holographic displays, Leia didn't, and they are shockingly still around. This is a Nubia Pad 3D that, just like the Hydrogen One, is lit by Leia. This tablet just came out. It's very expensive at $1,100. <laughs> but a lot of the promises or a lot of the potential that we saw here on the Hydrogen One actually ended up being reality. So, and perhaps most importantly, check this out. It's a game called Dungeon. And it's not just a pre-rendered video. I can actually walk around and battle skeletons with my sword. Is it a good game? Uh, not really. <laughs> But it does work, and it is a real game, and the 3D effect on here is really good. And that's the first thing you notice, is that Leia's technology has gotten a lot better. The 3D effect on this device is way more convincing. It looks significantly brighter. It's less pixelated. There's no green overcast like the original. It just looks really pretty darn good. And then the display itself, when not in 3D mode, looks like a super high-resolution modern tablet. It looks fantastic. So that's the dungeon game, but what else started happening? Well, we've got a bunch of apps that were teased for the Hydrogen One, but never really ended up coming, like Leia Chat, which is FaceTime for other people with Leia devices. So yeah, good luck finding anyone to chat with in Leia Chat. <laughs> 
<laughs> You've also got Leia Flix, which is a service wherein you can pay to rent movies from Leia. If you buy this tablet, you get a couple bundled with the device, Gravity and Pacific Rim. Though I will say that the movies look uh, to be kind, pretty awful. I thought that this was because of a really lousy 3D display and that the effect hadn't improved very much. This was my first exposure to the tablet and I said, eh, it still kind of sucks, what a shame. No, no, no. That's because the the streaming bitrate of this video, for whatever reason, is actually just terrible. If you put on a high resolution Blu-ray file, which I've done, you can play back this 22 gig file. We're watching Marvel movies today. And it looks really, really legitimately good. Not just like, oh, it's pretty good for what it is. No, this is like a fantastic, very dark movie. Where's the light part? There we go. I mean, it really is pretty cool. After 20, 30 seconds, you probably wouldn't even really remember that you're watching this in 3D. And yeah, the resolution isn't as high as when it's in 2D, but it looks really pretty good. This tablet is $1,100. And when it's not in 3D, well, it's not a very good tablet. And that's mostly because it's an Android tablet, but it is cool. And that's something that the Hydrogen One just never was. Despite promises from Janner that accessories would come for this device in 2019, they never did. The project was canned less than a year after units started shipping to customers. Red abandoned the project, Janner retired, and now we're just left with a memory of what could have been. But I prefer today's timeline because 3D stuff, I don't know. We just keep trying and it's never good enough. So why do we keep trying? Thank you so much for watching, but most importantly, and as always, stay snazzy.